This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. A little quant trading today, a little trend trading today, a little CTA thinking, price action conversation. We're at Siebert of two quants. You can find him easily on Twitter. Moritz does the podcast with Niels over there at Top Traders Unplugged. A good show. I've appeared on that show. Fun stuff. And you know, when you get a recommendation from Jerry Parker, and I did get a recommendation from Jerry Parker, and Jerry says, Mike, you should probably take a look at having Moritz on your show. Jerry was right. What follows is my conversation with Moritz Siebert, and we cover the gauntlet. We cover all kinds of territory. So if you want to have that reminder, if you want to be relit to the trend thinking, the quant thinking, the personal responsibility thinking, enjoy. Enjoy the next one hour with Moritz Siebert. Well, what's freaking me out right now is this testing thing like there's no seemingly logical reason that i could see a doctor on cnn this morning say that america needs 500 million rapid tests now if we really need 500 million rapid tests can i draw the conclusion that mr vaccine did not work i mean what is all the testing for i'm just kind of losing my marbles in the states i need to get the hell out <laughs> so we can talk about all of this. I'm fine for that to be on the record. I mean, we're about to get hit by a fifth wave here, apparently, because of Omicron in Germany. Apparently. You're not scared of it yourself? Well, because it's starting. The politicians say it's coming. There's no way to avoid it. We'd either have to go into a very severe, hard lockdown, or the fifth wave will be there. About 10 days ago, nine, eight, 10 days ago, something like that, I traveled back from Las Vegas to Munich, and I spent a couple of days in Vegas. And I thought, well, if I don't get Corona there, you don't get it anywhere. <laughs> that place is a zoo. Casinos, it's 5 a.m. in the morning. People are partying. The clubs are full. You know the drill. MGM, massively large place. So if you don't get it there, you don't get it really anywhere. Came back and I self-tested. Self-tested again the next day, negative. I thought, well, interesting. A third test, still negative. So it didn't get it there. <laughs> really, my wife's happy about that too. Here's the part that I don't understand, and this is not meant to be emotional or political, and this will probably nicely dovetail into a logical trend-following type conversation, but what's the point of the test? Well, they want to know here, I mean, I can probably answer that for this country. They want to know if you're positive, and if you're positive, they kind of like single you out, and you're no longer allowed to go to the supermarket. You have to quarantine. You have to stay at home. Here's what I'm really driving at. If we broke this down like into a math equation or something... Aren't there just too many positive people and too many people that have not been tested for us not to look at the whole process of testing as just, it's like whack-a-mole, it's ridiculous. That's the part I don't understand. It's like, how many people in the grocery store have not been tested? If you're unlucky enough to have been tested or not been tested, or you test positive or test negative, my understanding is, is if 70 to 80% of the people that test positive, and I was one of them this summer, are asymptomatic, no symptoms. And I guess this is leading into our conversation. The thinking part is losing me. And I guess what ultimately, again, if I'm dovetailing into something like a quant-like thinking, this is just a great demonstration of mass psychology, mass delusion, mass whatever. If people want to know why markets can run, look at what's going on in Corona and COVID. Just look at how scared people get. I mean, am I onto something? You're absolutely onto something. I mean, these tests, if you think about it, I could be positive. I could carry the virus right now. If you and I were in the same room, then I could infect you because I'm positive. But the test would still be negative because it takes maybe 24 up to 72 hours for the test to really give a signal that you're positive. So I could have the virus, still move around, go to the grocery store and infect somebody. None of that stuff is 100%. I'm probably leaning more to the liberal side of things. I just want to have my 
freedom back and as many freedoms as I honestly possibly can. If you're talking about freedom, you're talking about classical liberal, if we wanted to get definitional. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly right. And, and look, I mean, I've done what they told me to do in a way, got vaccinated, got vaccinated again, got a booster shot. I've done all of this. And now people with all the double vax, all the boosters are all breaking out in record waves with this new variant. Yeah, look, <laughs> maybe. It's not even controversial to me. It's kind of like, why can't we just logically look at this and say, okay, somebody's taken, quote, two vax, they've taken a booster, and then there's breakouts everywhere, and they're still transmitting this thing, and they're still getting sick. At some point in time, doesn't somebody in the corner of the room raise their hand and say, excuse me, something's not working right here? Yeah, it is not working right here. So what's the alternative? You could say, let it rip. If we let it rip and nobody does anything, then the hospitals and the ICUs are going to be overflowing and we'll have that type of a problem. So I get that. But you're right. I don't think that the stuff that we've been doing is actually preventing the spread of the disease. It's, it's making people sick in the way that for a period now, since two years, we're going into soft lockdowns, into hard lockdowns, coming out of lockdown. We're no longer traveling. We're no longer going on vacation. It feels weird. And what I don't want is, I sometimes have that feeling that the government and the state has now learned how to do a lockdown. Okay, so we can lock you guys in because there's a virus. Well, I really want that to be taken away from them again, because now that they've learned it, I mean, aren't they going to do it whenever they, I don't want to say that they always do it, but it's kind of like, it's a trick in the toolbox. Here's my simple hack. I want to get back to a place that does not speak English regularly. So I don't know what anyone is saying. I'm having a headache because I'm hearing too much English. I don't want to hear a language that I understand. <laughs> That's my hack to avoid it, really. Look, I'm not worried about anything right now at all. I think we've reached the point where there's enough information and being worried is not a way to live. Listen, let's jump in with something. Let me shift you out of that. I don't want to keep you at- Terrible topic. COVID insanity, <laughs> yeah. I'm giving myself a headache. But here's where I want to jump in. This is kind of an interesting, nugget, and I think you will relate to this. We might spend the whole hour on this particular issue. I think it's terribly important. I've tried to tackle it in books. I'm pretty well convinced, though, when I talk to people that are unaware of quant trading or CTA or systems trading or trend following, I'm pretty sure that even if I try to explain it to smart people, unless they've done a little reading and a little homework, it just flies over their head. And here's where I'm going at. The idea that if one is going to trade whatever market, XYZ market, it could be cocoa, it could be gold, it could be futures, ETFs, whatever, why do we have to know the name? Why do we have to know the name of the market? Don't have to know the name. You know that in Asia, in Japan, for instance, they don't have names, they have numbers, four digits. 4705 is Takeda Pharmaceutical, if I remember that correctly from my trading days. You don't need to know the names. It could be any type of symbol, any type of character combination. All you need to know from my perspective is price movement. I need to have a history of price and a history of range to calculate risk, my definition of risk. That's it. Whether that's Coca-Cola, gold, or cocoa, doesn't matter. Here's where it gets tricky. We're trying to explain to that smart doctor, that smart attorney, hell, even that value investor that's never really lifted a finger to try to understand quant trading. There's not any emotional attachment to what you're trading. It's literally, let's look at this, whatever symbol represents whatever market we're trading. If there's movement there where we can enter and exit to capture some of that, that's all it's about. But that's very difficult to explain to people. I think back to Ed Sakota, him saying, I could put three or four charts in the wall and stand away from the wall two or three meters, and I can tell you how to trade those charts without even knowing what those charts represent. I really want to see if we can spend some time to unpack this as to most people are just thinking, I want to get Tesla after some big announcement or whatever. I want to buy something cheap. This idea of trading numbers is hard to wrap the mind around. Yes. Or you want to have GameStop because that's on the Reddit platform and that's the news. Or you want to have Axon because Axon is now a perceived value stock because the stock price has been going down so much. When Ed steps back from this wall and looks at this chart, he puts himself into a very long-term trend following perspective because the farther away you step, the more long-term your vision of that chart becomes in a way. 
He's right. I mean, that is what you need if you want to be a long-term trend follower. If that thing goes up, your position is long. If it doesn't have any direction, maybe your position is neutral. And if it's going down, then your position should be short. That's it. But you don't have to fall in love with any company name, with any business model. You don't have to like Coca-Cola or Berkshire Hathaway. None of that is important. And neither are their balance sheet numbers important. PE, price to sales, cash flow, all of these things, all the analyst reports that are being published by investment banks. Sometimes I've been sent those reports. I don't read them. I don't open them. They have no value for me. If anything, they just clock up my mind and they waste my time. I don't enjoy reading them. I don't want to read them and I don't need them. So why would I open them? If I take what you just said about the analyst reports coming in, the flip side of you saying, me saying, you only need the price data, the flip side, how much fundamental data is enough? If every bank out there, if I'm a fundamental guy, I'm just playing devil's advocate. If I'm a fundamental guy and I want to trade Apple, whatever, don't I want the report? Don't I want the analyst report from every bank? Would I not be missing something if I didn't have it all? What in the hell is the definition of all? How do you even tackle that problem? I mean, I guess if you enjoy reading these reports, if you get something out of them that you think is valuable to your trading, then by all means, read them. This is a free world. Read as many of them as you want. They're just not for me. I'm pretty sure there's traders out there, fundamental traders, good traders. Nobody comes to mind, but I'm pretty sure they exist because there's so many people, so many traders on planet Earth. There are some people out there that are really good trading fundamental information and looking at the right stuff and connecting the dots and coming to good decisions and good trades. It is just not my skill. It is not my understanding of trading. I don't want to trade that way. I just want to trade as many markets as I possibly can, as many independent and correlated markets as I possibly can to increase the probability of getting onto some extreme rides and ride them all the way to the end. You're so nice and deferential, not taking my bait to criticize these people that want to read every <laughs> I, fundamental <laughs> bank report that you know is a complete waste of time. The fundamental traders that you're talking about out there that are successful, and I'm sure they are, they are not reading the fundamental report from every bank in this world about Apple, because you and I know there's most likely going to be conflicting information in there. And then what rule book am I looking at for conflicting fundamental information? This is kind of an exercise in thinking. What does one do with all of this conflicting fundamental information? Because at the end of the day, you got to make a buy decision. You got to make an exit decision. You got to bet properly. That's the part where I'm getting you, trying to push you a little bit. Yeah. But you know what? I mean, even though I don't use their information, and that is very subjective, just me personally speaking, and I hope I don't offend anyone here. I think that the research that comes out of banks, be that Goldman, Morgan Stanley, again, I'm not criticizing any of these names, but that is research that's produced in order to be sold. So that's sold to institutional investors, to fund managers for a fee, at least here in Europe. The old days where the buy side clients just received the research for free and got invitations for lunch and all that type of stuff, that got regulated away. They now have to actually pay for that research. But it is research that's specifically being produced. I think it's produced in order to be sold. What do people do with it? Do people like put it on the shelf and look at it? Or do they talk about it at parties? What do people do with all these reports? I'm not being a jerk. I'm a little bit of a jerk. I'm just curious. I don't know what they do with it. You've been inside the banking industry. I'm not so sure you're giving me the real scoop behind the scenes. I want to know behind the scenes what people are doing with these things. <laughs> I haven't been on that side of the banking industry, so I haven't been writing research. I was trading derivatives and all that type of stuff. I had access to all these reports, but even back then, I didn't read them. But you cross paths with these people. You'd ask them, hey, listen, you know, I know you're writing all this stuff, and you're a really smart guy, and you went to a great school, and you're a great writer, and all that kind of stuff, but isn't this all just bullshit? I never put it to them that way. I'm probably too nice of a guy. <laughs> I want to give them something positive. There's a quantitative research department that used to exist, maybe still exists today in all of these banks, that produced research that related to the volatility of derivative markets, looking at forward curves, looking at skew and vol and correlation and these type of things. And those research reports, they're actually valuable because they're based on facts. They're based on data. It's been traded in the market. It's printed on the tape. It's there. People have transacted on that data, which is why you can see it. The analysis that you can derive from that, I found them interesting. But when you and I talk about the PE of Tesla, well, what is that thing anyways? Everybody has a different view on Tesla. 
some people say it's going to go to 4,000. Some people say it's going to go to 400. Some people say it's going to go to zero. I don't know. I'll let price dictate my position. You have no number on Tesla. I have no number on Tesla, nothing, zero. For some people that are unfamiliar with a quant thinking, a CTA thinking, a trend thinking, you having no number on Tesla, I don't know, maybe they think, well, you're being flippant, you're being silly, you're being cocky, you're holding something back, you're not telling me the real scoop, you're a little arrogant, something like that. They don't get that you're just being matter-of-factly truthful and none of those pejoratives that somebody might want to say about you are true at all. Here's my number on Tesla, the only number that really matters to me, which is my exit. By the way, I don't have a Tesla position because I don't trade single stocks, but let's just say it were any other market. Assume for a second I traded Tesla. If I were long Tesla today, I probably would be long Tesla today, I would have one number and that's my exit. I have a long position on, I know today where I'd be getting out if price moved down. That's the number I have. And then I close the position and I move on. It sure seems like that if you could get most people started early with that simple thinking that you just described with Tesla, first year of college, maybe even high school, I don't know. If you could get people thinking like that, we'd have a much better financial world if people could kind of approach it that simply versus the other way where you're trying to assemble reams and reams of analyst reports on Tesla. Yes and no, I'd say. Definitely yes from like when you and I talk about this. I mean, this is how we trade. This is how I recommend my friends, my family, and people close to me to trade. Actually, it takes a while to get your head around that type of trading. Experience is needed, and I can go into that if you want. But if everybody did this, Mike, if everybody were a trend-following trader, there wouldn't be enough meat on the bone for me to still like it, probably. You write these excellent books. You give people access to trend-following and how it works. It's actually not that difficult to understand. It's difficult to get your head around it psychologically. But if everybody traded that way, all the world traded that way, then the strategy would no longer work, I'm pretty sure. And I wouldn't like that. So when we do these podcasts and we go out there and we say we want to democratize the world of hedge funds, I'm not sure what that even means, and we want to get more people to invest in trend-following type of strategies... I say that with a person, yeah, but okay, please do, but not too many, okay? Hopefully not everybody listens. I still remember back in the day, I was working my first book and I had this white paper from Larry Harris, who's the chair of finance at the University of Southern California. I think he's still there. Last I checked, he was still there. And he had this very simple paper, but it was very direct about, at least when you're trading futures, the zero sum nature of futures. Yeah, look, when I lead off this conversation talking about mass insanity, in the land of COVID testing and COVID vaccines, well, you're right. We're not going to convert the masses of people to think normal. It's just never going to happen in our lifetime. It's just on the margins. We can get a few people to maybe uh, come our way and do a little bit better in life. But most people are going to be going down the path of the big mass, providing that zero sum gain to people that are trading with a quant mindset. You're absolutely right. And that's because trend following is just too difficult to stomach and way too difficult to like for institutional investors and most retail people in the same way. They cannot follow through. They can look at trend following and look at the past year. The past year, I mean, I've just had a great trading year. And they look at the past 12 months, maybe the past 18 months, and you know it's been going kind of good. Uh, so they like it, they invest, and then it goes into a drawdown and they leave the strategy again and never come back. That way, they're wasting a lot of money. They're wasting a lot of their time. Stupid error. It's funny when you say that, though, that it's hard for people to like. I guess it depends at what point in time you are in history. The equity market bottom, let's say the NASDAQ in the fall of 2002, down 77% after a pretty nasty couple year drawdown, or 08 to 09, or I guess 07 to 09. I think people's perspective on whether they're accepting to a alternative strategy or not would be different than right now. Because right now, if people just quote buying and holding, they look at a trend following alternative, they might be like, well, gosh, I don't need anything else. That was how it felt at the top of 1999. You know, I don't need anything else. Everything's going straight up. I can use the simplest buy and hold strategy. I don't need all this stuff. But I think your point about whether people are willing to look at the way that you say that the trend following can be too hard 
I might make the counter argument that it depends on what point in history we're sitting at. Because if you're down 77% on the NASDAQ and you're buying hold account, you're probably willing to try anything. Yeah. Many of these people that have had a 77% drawdown or they go like into 56% drawdown on the S&P 500 because they buy and hope, many of them don't come back to the markets. I think that they're probably just knock out. The markets are so brutal. The most important thing, I say this all the time, is you have to survive trading long term. Don't blow up. That is goal number one. Don't die. If you're dead, you can't play. But you can't play. You have no chips left. Survive, manage your risk, and then the returns will kind of take care of themselves if you don't over-optimize, if you stay diversified, if you appropriately size your positions. There's a couple of things that you need to do right. But trend following on a bunch of markets is a really protective strategy, even though when you look at it on a day-to-day -day basis, it goes up and down. Sometimes it goes into a larger drawdown, a longer drawdown than you'd like, but it is still a very protective strategy because you're keeping losses small and you go for the juggler with all your winners, with all the things that work. And I don't fall control or any of that. We sometimes have these discussions and it's like, yeah, I may be long lumber, then short lumber. Now I'm long lumber again. If lumber goes on this massive ride again, I have a good position now. I'm not going to be reducing that position because lumber becomes more volatile. If I have a gain in lumber, open trade equity, that's a winning position. That's a really cool position. I just want to take that football and take it to the touchdown zone. I don't really care how it zigs and zags. It's a winner and I'll just run with it. The emotional state though with the open trade equity, that can be tricky for people, huh? It can be very tricky because the gains are there for you to take. Lumber is telling you that, hey, here's $100,000. Come on, take me. And you say, no, no, no. This is money that the markets have given to me. I'm very liberal in playing with the market's money with that variation margin that has accrued positively to my account. But hell no, if that is eating into my core capital, into my balance sheet, because I'm in a loss, then I become very tight. It's like, you know, I'm not allowing anybody to play with my money. I'm getting out of the position. I'll try many, many times to get back in. It doesn't matter. Difficult too, by the way, to do. But it's a game of bets. It's successive bets, one after the other. Do the next 1,000 trades. The individual trade hardly matters. The individual market hardly matters. Just do all the trades. And then the results will hopefully take care of themselves. People will send me emails. They'll lead off and they'll say, I'm a trend following trader. And they'll say, well, I've got a few challenges or something. And they'll say, often I see this one. My biggest challenge is when to take profits. They don't mean when to exit. They mean when to take profits. So they lead off with, I'm a trend following trader and their biggest challenge is when to take profits. And I, I always just want to close the screen and not respond. I try to respond because they're friendly enough to write out. It's like, where do you start? Because they're not really a trend following trader. That's right. Just go with these trades. I mean, how many times has it happened that personally I look at a market and creeps in and I think, well, that's done. That trend is overextended. We'll probably do a correction and I'll give back that open trade equity. And how many times have I been wrong and that market just keeps going and going and going and it goes higher than you could, <laughs> you would have ever thought. And you need these trades. This is the tricky thing. You need that P&L from these outlier trades. And there may only be two or three in any given year, if that but you need them because they pay for all the crappy stuff that's going on. So there you have it. It's very lopsided trading, which is why it is so difficult because humans, people, we'd like to be right almost all the time, ideally 100%, all the decisions that we want to make. Yeah, let's make that a good decision. We want to see a positive result. Trend following is not about that. Trend following gives you a lot of negative feedback, hopefully in small magnitude, and then occasionally you go for the jackpot. That's a way of living. To just finish that thought, I mean, I wasn't born that way. When I started trading 25 years ago, I was wired the other way around. Didn't know anything about the markets. I looked at my dad. This was like the mid 90s. He was trading. There was still Deutschmark times. He was buying stock like Manus Mann and names that don't even exist anymore. And I looked at the TV with him. I was like, well, this is fantastic. Stuff's moving and, and you can make money. And then the bull market in tech happened. And I just made money by being naively long. So I felt very good. And I thought, that's it. That's the secret. And obviously, I lost that money again. And then 
I caved in just reading books and doing research and hours and hours and hours. I mean, I did <laughs> countless hours of research and reading and studying that stuff and doing all the mistakes of the book, over-optimizing things. And it didn't come naturally to me. I made a million mistakes, hopefully not the same one twice. And hopefully I learned from all the mistakes that I did. And But over time, only over the years, could I get as thick-skinned as I may sound, I don't want to say that I am, but maybe it sounds a little thick-skinned. I just take them on the chin. I let those losing trades come. They don't kill me, but I can continue to play. I don't have any sleepless nights and I don't care about the losers anymore. They don't make me grumpy. I can go down to the dinner table, have dinner with the kids, have a losing day, many losing trades on. Still a great day. Keep me at that early stage. Talk about mid 90s up until the dot com era. You're getting started. I know you got started at HSBC in 98, I believe. But give me some flavor or a mentor or a book or the moment, because you just said you were the guy that was perhaps started off as the fundamental guy or read a book about Buffett. And you're like, oh my gosh, I want to be the next Warren Buffett. Then you realize that that's not how Warren Buffett trades exactly, but that's a whole different discussion. What was the moment? Was there a moment for you? I mean, for me, and I've shared this before, I think most likely, I could probably go back to my old emails and figure out exactly, but I think most likely for me, it was the turtle story and then understanding how they traded. And then that quickly spread into all the tentacles of the other people that were trading similar to the turtles. But I think the turtle story for me was the one where I was like, uh-oh, could have even been Ed Sakota in the Market Wizards book. Could have been one of those, or Larry Hyde in the market, something like that. But was there a moment for you that really kind of galvanized you? I didn't know of the turtles back then. I didn't know Jerry. I didn't know the trend following books. I mean, from what I remember, this is now 25 years ago. I got interested because my dad traded stock. And then he gave me some money. I actually forgot the amount. It may have been like 10,000 Deutschmarks or something like that. I said, look, you have to go down to the bank. By the way, I grew up in a super small village, like 2,000 people. There's definitely more cows and chickens than human beings in that village in the middle of nowhere in Bavaria. I walked into this bank and said, look, I, I want to open that stock account. The guy says, no, you can't do that because you're only 16 or 17. And so my dad signed it for me and bought some random stock only because I like their name. I mean, can you imagine that? I purchased stocks such as Czech White Productions. I don't even know what they did. I mean, they're definitely bankrupt, but I like the name. That was my decision-making process. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I had a position on it worked, then it stopped working. I then, as you said correctly, started HSBC and became a derivatives trader, structuring these structured products. I think the first books I read, they were actually textbooks on derivatives pricing theories so of Black Shoals and these type of things. I became this type of a trader on a bank book where you actually don't trade. I mean, you do trade in the sense that you put positions on, but your job is to hedge the book. It's very different to like, today I trade because I want to make money. When you are on a dealing desk, you trade because you want to hedge the risk, crystallize the margin that's embedded in the products that you're selling to clients. Mike, I don't know what it was, but he used the Bloomberg's. You had to have got the price action feeling at some point yes, in time. I, I mean, I'm not going to allow you to say it was 25 years ago. You're too old now and your memory is dodgy. There's got to be a moment where this price action thing crystallized. Yes. When you sit in front of a Reuters, back then it was Reuters and it didn't have Bloomberg. But the default is a 200-day moving average. Every chart that comes up has a 200-day moving average. I heard people on the trading floor speaking about momentum. If the price is above the 200-day moving average, you should be long. That was your start to the thinking. That was the start. So I took this to, <laughs> it was already Excel and no longer Lotus, and tested this stuff on the Eurostox 50 and the DAX index and the stuff that I knew back then. What year approximately? 90s, NASDAQ, right? Okay. We had the Neuermark, the new market here in Germany. It was a really big thing. You're just a guy at that time at HSBC, you're seeing the screens, you're seeing the moving averages. At that moment in time, you don't have any perception of this kind of CTA industry. No, nothing, zero, no turtle knowledge, nothing. I took that stuff into a spreadsheet and I experimented with moving averages. I didn't know about a breakout. I didn't know that existed because it wasn't a default setting on the Reuters screen 
or on the Bloomberg terminal. Today, you can easily do that. But back then, I'm pretty sure it didn't exist. So I started with these averages, simple moving averages, not exponentially weighted. And then I created a portfolio in Excel, probably stock markets only. That I really do not remember, but I'm pretty sure it must have been only stock markets because I was an equities guy and I didn't look at gold or crude or any of this. Were you sharing these ideas with other people or are you kind of like a, a solo mad scientist in the basement? Solo mad scientist on the trading floor. When everybody goes home, then I sit there alone, eating a burger, drinking a Coke, probably crappy food back then and working until midnight testing these simple strategies. And I got them to work. Then I started trading them. But as you know, you're never really, well, back then at least, you're never really happy with the results you get. So you think, well, I can outsmart this thing and do something better. Instead of trading the 200-day moving average, how about I trade the 175-day moving average on the Eurostox 50 and the 215-day moving average on the Dow? and something else in between and mix those roles and put a filter on top of it and these type of things, because the back test looks absolutely amazing. I didn't know anything about over-optimization and curve fitting back then. I thought this is how you do it. You create a system using these rules and the more rules you can come up with, the more overlays, the more filters, then the smarter you are and the better the result. Obviously today I know that the opposite is true, but this is what I did. I traded that for a while. This is now kind of like the period where I started to read other books, other books than like derivative Black Scholes pricing type of textbooks. I started with all the fun stuff like Liar's Poker and you know, we all do this. But then, you know, reminiscences, your books came up. I just purchased everything that I could get my hand on. I have bookshelves full of just trading books. A lot of them are really terrible. I read them anyways because I thought that I could find a nugget in there. And some of them are absolutely fantastic. Toby Crable's book, I have one of the editions here, very expensive now to get, but here you go, opening range breakout. There you have a breakout. So all of a sudden I knew what a breakout was. Okay, here's a short-term open range breakout, but nevertheless, it's a breakout. I started reading about all of these techniques and then one after the other, I tested all of them. I really did the hard work and I put them all for a test drive, all in Excel. I didn't do any programming back then. Today I do, but back then I didn't. It was real clumsy VBA, Excel, big spreadsheets. I was pretty good with that spreadsheet stuff, still am. But I tested everything. I still, by the way, have that tendency today. I enjoy doing that. I test a lot of stuff, but most of the stuff goes directly into the trash can. Today, back then it didn't, but today I just disregard most of the results that I get. You brought up Toby. I think he's one of the most interesting people that I've met. He's been on this podcast. I think if people know about him, they might say, well, gosh, Mike, what kind of connection could you possibly have with Toby? Like it's a completely different world and not really. No, he just excels at a time frame that's very different than a trend following time frame. But the systematic exit strategies, all that kind of stuff, that kind of thinking, I mean, that's why he's so easy to talk to, too. He just chose a different time frame to work in. Yeah, and some different strategies, and that's all fine. And obviously, he's built the technology and the firm around that. They have their members at exchanges. They have low commissions, much lower slippage probably than I have even. They've made a huge technology investment in order to be able to trade so short term and not be eaten up by all the costs. It's hard to compete with, with the average Joe out there that wants to be the next Toby Crable or the next Jim Simons. Really tough to compete with. You can't do that. You need millions and millions of dollars to actually build a business such as that and understand it and get all the quant def and IT people in that firm to join you and protect your IP. Very difficult business to build. So I think they have a moat around them. Cray will go very large now. The numbers of people that send me emails and tell me they are trading five minute bars or whatever, and they are trend following traders. And oh, the trend following will work on the five minute bars. I get more emails like that than just people that want to trade trend following. If that doesn't work for Toby, it's not going to work for you or me. Because if you or I are trading five minute bars, trend following, I mean, okay, Robin Hood is zero commission, but really they aren't. Somebody pays for everything. I think you'll just pay far too much in bid offer spreads and commissions, and it slips away. Why make your life a living hell? looking at these screens on a five minute basis and not being able to move away from your desk during the day when the sun shines. If you can 
reduce that trading speed. Yeah, it's going to be choppier the more long term you get, but it's a nicer way of living for sure. It does have a positive expectancy in terms of returns. What's not to like about that? You pay way less in commissions and slippage. Let me shift you to something that some people might immediately think I'm being conflicting about. Someone that knows something about trend trading or systematic trading, we have this mindset that you've been talking about in this conversation, and then you just play it out and you see what happens. Well, when you play it out and you see what happens over the decades, you get these often get these events. Could have been bearings, it could have been long-term capital management, it could have been the dot-com crash, it could have been the Great Recession, it could have been the COVID in March of 2020. All these events, the mindset of having a strategy that can prepare for big events, crises, that mindset seems to have changed, I think, a lot since 08 because there hasn't been a significant number of events perhaps as many as there were really big market changing, the world changes events like there were in the preceding, let's say, 20 years. What's your perspective on that? Beyond the COVID time period, we've been on one massive ride without having any big downsides. Yeah, in equities, I think that's right. I mean, there were just ever since the global financial crisis, it's kind of like that miraculous decade of the S&P just moving higher and the 60-40 portfolio outperforming everything else. The risk parity is tough to beat too. I think we had our fair share of events. Here in Europe, we had a government debt crisis. Remember in 2015 when the Swiss franc decoupled. Actually, Mike, yesterday something interesting happened. You're fair though to point out that I was really talking about equities. You're fair to point that out. Yeah. Yesterday, actually, I don't trade that market, but super wild move. Today is the 21st of December. So yesterday on the 20th, you have Erdogan in Turkey lowering interest rates in the face of just increasing inflation. Okay. So that sounds weird, right? So normally if he were a Falker, then do something else. He'd do the opposite, but he's lowering rates and inflation is very high. That weakens the lira, the Turkish lira. And when you look at the chart, dollar lira or euro lira, the lira just goes down, 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 and dollar just goes up, 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 up against it. Trend following up would be long the dollar and short the lira. And then yesterday, he said something. I don't know exactly what it was, but I read the headlines like he rescued the lira, he's capital controls. I'm not sure what the guy said, but it dropped from like 19 to 12 <laughs> in a day. It reminded me of what the Swiss franc did against the euro and the dollar on, I think, January 15th, 2015, you have these events, they do exist. It's just so important that none of these events kill you. They need to be one of many that you can stomach. You can't have all your risk in just one market. Now, that's very clear because these things happen. GameStop happens. It happens all the time, really. Yeah, I've seen you make the case if we're just comparing something like a systematic thinking or a discretionary thinking, and we've talked about this so far in the conversation, there are discretionary traders out there that excel, can have fantastic records. I think it's harder to find those track records. It's harder to analyze them. But if you were just to contrast, if you were teaching a college class and you were to kind of contrast systematic versus discretionary, it does seem like that we as human beings with a finite lifetime, no life extension yet, with whether we know it or not, a nice goal would be to have some peace, some happiness, less stress, freedom. It sure seems like, and obviously I make this case, but it sure seems like systematic for most people is going to beat discretionary. Discretionary to me is like almost the cartoon of the guy that's posting the 15 monitors on his desk. I mean, who in their bright mind wants to be sitting in front of 15 monitors, and not that you could actually use all these 15 monitors in any way, it's all a dog and pony show, but who wants to be sitting in front of 15 monitors for, I don't know, 8, 10, 12, 15 hours a day? It does seem like Systematic could present and can present a nicer quality of life, because I think that's ultimately what we're all after. Look, it sure is. I mean, some people, I think they're very happy sitting in front of 15 screens in a dark room all day long, playing the markets or doing something else. I mean, everybody everybody should be doing what you they- You think they're happy or you think they're crazy? Maybe, maybe some of them are happy and they really enjoy doing that. But I'm not here to judge, let them do it. I can only live my life. My life isn't that. 
I don't want to be sitting in front of 15 screens, looking at five minute bars and discretionarily trying to figure out what I should be buying or selling. I think there's better things to do in life. You only have one life, by the way, disregarding the life extension idea that you just brought up, which would be great. But given that today, I know that I only have one life based on the information I have. I, I want to live that life in the best possible way. And sitting in a cave with 15 screens, not the way I want to live. The guy in a cave with 15 screens doesn't in his heart of hearts believe that you can compete with him or do better than him. They've just decided there's a mental block there. I can't imagine that Moritz, without doing what I'm doing, can compete with me. Yeah, I'm sure he, he or she thinks that they, of course, must be better because they have 15 screens and doing something on a much more granular basis. And because they're actually sitting in front of the screens and they're paying attention to the markets, that must have some edge. I don't think that's true trading, you need to have an edge somewhere. My edge is I give myself into the system. I completely accept that the system is the system and I will follow these rules, which for some people is very difficult to accept. That is kind of like step one. Then you need to know how to build that system, trade that system and stick with it over the long term to get the rewards. That is my way of trading. Other people find edges elsewhere. As I've said, I mean, there's a niche of fundamental traders, there's a niche of long short traders discretionarily, and then some of them will be really great. It's just not what I can do. But you need to have an edge and you need to find and figure out what that edge is and then use it. But if you don't know what that edge is, if you think that you can sit in front of the screen trading five minute bars and something will happen only because you have 15 screens, that's not an edge. I'm not sure what that is. You don't have the experience yet. You don't know how markets work. That is pretty naive to think that you can make money that way. Why do you think so many of the systematic traders, trend traders, quant traders, again, whatever we want to call those folks, us folks, why do you think that the life philosophy outlook is often similar or comparable or just that there's a certain, I think we did one podcast before, but I've not talked to you one-on-one -on -one like this. That's an interesting point as people listen, because if we've not talked one-on-one, -on -one, how in the blazes can we relate so easily? It's not just because of strategy, because you do, you're in the trend following mindset, you get it, but you also do some shorter term stuff. So it's not completely, but the philosophical life philosophy amongst people that choose this price action mindset sure seems to come down to this. I'm responsible. I'm not going to wake up each day and blame someone else. That's right. I think that comes with the business. As I've alluded to, I wasn't born that way. I think 20, 25 years ago, I was a different Moritz. I didn't have that trend following mindset. Were you kind of like a punk kid? What kind of kid were you? Yeah, not? tennis, red colored hair, punk, techno, whatever. I mean, <laughs> my parents didn't like me very much. I don't want to admit all the weird things I've done. Look, back then, my goal was to become a tennis player. I moved to Australia to play tennis. It didn't work out. So I got into trading. It, it was a fun period of time. But from a trading perspective, I probably was blaming the market. And I probably was blaming other people. Oh, that didn't work. And why does check white productions all of a sudden turn around and blah, blah, blah. I think it takes years to really form you and develop. But once you get into that thinking that, hey, look, I'm placing these trades. Nobody's forcing me to place these trades. I need to accept their outcome no matter what. But I have one entry, one exit, and a stop loss. And this is the system that I'm running. I'm essentially placing bets. I don't know tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen in a minute from now, let alone in a month. So be it. Copy paste that thinking onto many aspects of life, not just trading. All the decisions that you make. Do you want to go work for somebody or do you want to do your own thing? Do you want to spend the afternoon walking your dock or do you want to do some research on your trading system? Those are all decisions. At the end of the day, what I've learned is do more of what works and do less of what doesn't work. Just accept that things don't work out. Most of the things that you think should be working out in real life don't work out. They happen in a different way. Just accept it. Don't be mad. Move on. Do the next thing and try to find something that works. We start this conversation off and I bring up COVID and somebody might have some deep emotional whatever and they might immediately start punching the dog or something because they hear me talk about COVID. But if people are looking at this deeply, and I'm sure they are thinking this about you too, is that ultimately I think this is about a curiosity. You had a curiosity. You saw 
early on, the moving averages on the screens at the bank, and that spurred something in you to be curious. Just like opening this conversation up with a discussion of COVID, it wasn't to be, I'm right. It wasn't to be emotional. It was to be, there's some inconsistency here. There is something behind door three that I'm not being shown, and I want to see what's behind door three. That's the mindset that I see in someone like yourself. And of course, I like to think that I have it too. And many other guests on this podcast, but it's curiosity. You seem like a curious guy. You wanted to go down that path. Where do you think your curiosity came from? What were you doing when you were 10? Even though you were not the same Moritz you were 25 years ago, you were still curious because you had to take the steps to become the Moritz that you are today. I still am a curious mind. I always wanted to figure things out, understand why things work or why they don't work. And ideally, every day a new problem, you get bored easily. I always wanted to figure stuff out. I think that's true. It's still true today, by the way. What's so funny is when you get into like the late teens, you go to college and these type of things. Back then, it's kind of like you want to get a good job. You want to do something. Your parents and the people around you, they go, well, if you do this job, it's kind of like you have to give it everything. Some people in my family, they had one job, one occupation. Not all of them were employed. Some were, you know, they were running farms and stuff, but those that were employed, they had like one job for all of their life. They did that thing and then they retired. They never tried anything else. It was just that one job. The ethos uh, is, and still here in Germany to the present day, I think that's true, is people say, give yourself into that thing. Focus 100% of your energy on that task, on that job. I've always been like, well, but what if this doesn't work out? What if this isn't for me? Shouldn't I have something in, in my back pocket, like in the reserve and try out something else? a third thing and a fourth thing and a fifth thing and have like five balls up in the air at the same time and see which one's working and then do that. And that's frowned upon because people say, well, you're apparently not focused on one thing. You need to give all your energy to the one thing to make it right. If you don't give it 100% of your time, you can't make it right. And I think that's wrong. I have a lot of respect for younger people today who I think figure that out. They go like, ah, I don't want to work for BMW all the time. I want to do a little bit of BMW, maybe get a salary, but I also want to do three other things in crypto, in tech, in fintech, in Web3. What I was like, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what you should do and see what works. And then the stuff that works, you go with. But then you put some other balls up in the air all the time. It's like an entrepreneur that never stops being entrepreneurial. You always start thinking about creating a new business and you trend something that could work. Today, by the way, I mean, yeah, I do trend following trading. I never see my way. I don't see a possibility of me stopping being a trend following trader. That's the way I trade. But I have other interests. I love crypto, not from a maximalist point of view, but hey, there's fantastic trading opportunities there. There's NFTs, there's Web3, there's DeFi. There's stuff moving there. And it's obviously a growing business. Why not spend some time in that field and see if that works? It's a bet that I'm making. It's a business bet. It's not a trading bet that I'm trading a market. It's kind of like a business bet. And I have a bunch of these bets on. I like it that way. It keeps my life interesting. I have different things to talk about. I don't always need to be the boring guy at the cocktail party only talking about trend following. I can now talk about NFTs. Nobody knows what that is. The cocktail parties I go to, at least they don't know what that is. But they're fascinated by it. And all of a sudden, I have something else to talk about. Well, I relate to this thinking because as a guy who's, I don't say pigeonholed, that's not necessarily fair, but okay, this guy, Mike, he wrote these trend following books. Even when I started my podcast, I was like, well, I can only do so many trading podcasts. I'm going to have to broaden it out. And then ending up living in a place like Vietnam. I mean, there's not many Americans, trust me, I know there's not many Americans that go to live in a place like Vietnam unless they're working for a Fortune 500 company. I mean, I'm simply there because I can live anywhere and I choose to live there. Now, here I am back in the States now after 2.5 years, and I'm bumping into friends and family and stuff. Some people want to ask. They're extremely curious. Some people, they have no, no interest at all. But the curious ones, what's so interesting is to see their faces. Their faces are like, they just can't compute. Once you're in that position of life, like you described so accurately, once you're in that position of life of taking chances and learning new things and seeing new things, then if you bring yourself back to a place that perhaps where you started, 
where many of the friends and family that you were once around, not that they've had bad lives, but they've kept the horse blinders on. It's so interesting to watch the reactions to you because I can come back to visit, but I can't take them there with me. They can't go with me because they've chosen another path. I agree with you completely. This being curious to new opportunities. For me, being in Vietnam, it's a business decision. And what I do there mostly are business opportunities. So I completely share that thinking with you. And I think that also dovetails probably really nicely with the quant, trend following, price action, people, community, and voices. And none of these decisions are risk-free. It's not a risk-free decision to go and work for the man, for BMW in my example, for the rest of your life. That comes with its own risk. There's an opportunity cost to going to work for the man. There's an opportunity cost if you work for the man, if you work for any of these large corporations. Nothing is risk-free in life. Take a measured risk. I completely get it and understand it when there's like a family with five children, they depend on one income, and maybe it's not the time for them to take risk, spray their bets and leave a job that's paying the bills and pays the mortgage. I completely get that. I mean, everybody's in a different situation. But if you have the capacity to take some risk, you should do it. Risk is good. Risk is not something that's evil or bad. You have to size things appropriately, but risk in and by itself, I mean, it's odds, it's chances, it's probabilities, use them. Something good can come out of them. If they don't work, move on to the next thing and don't be mad at yourself. The good stuff that comes out of it changes your life in ways that you could never imagine. Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk took a lot of risks. They just worked miraculously for him. He's the richest man on the planet. He didn't become the richest man on the planet without taking risks. Moritz, we could kind of chat about this all day. We'll have to do further conversations in 2022. We could go down the rabbit hole and just beyond even trading, just go into all kinds of topics. Maybe you'll be one of my uh, NFT point people and we can go down that rabbit hole another day. Hey, where would you like to send people? I know they can find you easily on Twitter. You do the podcast with Niels. Where would you like to direct people to? Maybe best way to find me these days is on Twitter and also on two quants. There's twoquants.com, which is a website, which by the way, is one of these balls that I have up in the air together with a friend of mine, an idea that we came up one and a half years ago. And we enjoy doing that. It's a website with information about trading and NFTs as well, by the way. I've been there. It's another valuable resource for people that are looking to find voices like what we've been talking about today. I guess it was Jerry, I think, Jerry Parker, who was like, you got to get more hits on your show. And it's like, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't like really question or anything. Like, okay, Jerry's, I'll trust Jerry. So yeah, Jerry's awesome. But yeah, I mean, if people want to find me, look, I mean, these days, if you can't find me on the internet, then that's your fault. I'm very easy to find. That's the appropriate way to say it. If they can't find you, it's their fault. If they've got a problem with copying and pasting your name from the title of my podcast episode and it's they can't fault. find you, you probably don't want to know them. That's the simple hack, the simple heuristic. Exactly right. As Gerd Giggenrenzer would say. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> copy paste that correctly. I love Gerd though. He's great. He's still cooking, I think. I think he's in Berlin. As you know, he's German. He's a character. I actually have a old... DVD of one of the speeches that he gave at the university, Humboldt University of Berlin or something. I may have the name wrong, but it's an old presentation that he gave. He's just amazing. If you rip it and want to share it, I promise not to post it. I'd love to see it. I can dig it out. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Hey, Moritz, very cool stuff. I appreciate you coming on and I hope you have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, same to you and to all the listeners. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Enjoy some quiet days between the years and all the best for 2022. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.